Hey everybody, it's Galmanex, and welcome to the Duskmorn Arena Open Day 1 event. This is going to be a very competitive best of one Duskmorn sealed event. The Arena Open, as always, is the monthly competitive limited events, where if you make it to Day 2, you're competing for cash prizes, potentially up to $2,000. So it's a very high entry fee, it's for some pretty competitive players, always brings out some fierce, fierce competition. So... High stakes here, high risk, high reward, and starting day one with sealed, there's also some high variance there, especially in the play booster era. Really cross those fingers, hope to open some sweet cards. So without further ado, let's just bust open these packs, hope we open up some sweet cards, and see what we get to play with today. Alright, so we have opened up seven rares here. I think that's actually slightly below average in the play booster era, but we'll see how strong they are. Toby is excellent, giving us two creatures. The Overlord is just a really good stat line for its mana cost. Ghost Vacuum can fit into almost anything in sealed because it is a little bit slower, and that's going to be a fine finisher. Outside of that, nothing great, honestly. Waltz of Rage can be pretty good in the right color pair where you have a really beefy creature that's going to do a lot of damage to stuff, or if you have, like, Death Touchers in your deck. But it's a little more restrictive than just, like, a good monocolored rare. And then Restricted Office is also a little bit restrictive, as it's not going to be great in a deck with a bunch of high-power creatures. Uh, Victor's also a little bit narrow, depends on what's going on in the sealed pool, and same with the Cursed Recording, we need a bunch of good instants and sorceries. So a few rares that are going to be pretty great no matter what. And then some others that it really depends what we have to work alongside them. So certainly the commons and uncommons are going to matter a lot here. Um, if nothing else, in deciding which rares are actually our best. So as always, I like to start off checking out the colorless and multicolored stuff. Starting with colorless to see the kind of fixing we have here. There is no colorless fixing in the sealed pool. But we also get to see what cards we'll put into any deck we make. That's going to be Ghost Vacuum and Conductive Machete no matter what. If we have a ton of self mill and we're a little worried about grinding out the game too long, Chandelier can fit in fine. Um, Saw, if we have... Uh, if we need some like mana flood prevention in the late game is fine filler. And Found Footage, if we have a bunch of Delirium cards, is fine filler. So there's decent stuff here for a bunch of different archetypes, but I think Vacuum and Machete are strong enough to put into any deck. Now the multicolored cards can show some of the strongest cards in our sealed pool that aren't rares. Those tend to be the multicolored uncommons, so they can give us some other clear paths and clear directions for what to build around. So we could go like blue-white enchantments for Gremlin Tamer, because that card is incredibly powerful. We have two different green-blue manifest uncommons. Um, the Bookworm is very strong. The Growing Dread is just okay. The extra plus one plus one counter doesn't really matter nearly as much as the extra card advantage you can get off of Bookworm. But they both work pretty great together, so adding to green blue for that seems nice. Got a smoky lounge and a misty salon for blue red rooms, and I obviously love that deck. And that's about it. Nuisance is fine for slowing down the aggressive decks, but nothing super exciting. I do also want to see um, our lands here, because it doesn't automatically put the lands in when you check multicolored. So we have Green, blue, green, white, and white, red duels, and white, black. Okay, so a little bit of everything. Two green duels, three white duels. Yep, those are the most represented colors. All right, cool. Worth considering. I'll probably forget what exact duels we have, but as we look at the color pairs and see how they... Uh, meld together. We'll check the dual lands as well to see where the fixing is the best. So we're going to check every color individually, see what colors are the best. I like to just go to each color, cut the just completely unplayable cards that I would basically never run, like Unwanted Remake, um, or Emerge from the Cocoon if I'm not a Reanimator deck, or Possessed Goat if I'm not a Reanimator. Um, I guess I, I cut a little bit more than the completely unplayable, because, like, yeah, these cards have homes in very specific archetypes. I like to cut down to just cards that are at least fine filler in any white deck. And then that's going to show me which colors have the most tools to use in basically any color pair we build them in. 
I don't want to be looking at like a card that's like a borderline playable in black white and not good in anything else so here all of these are at least somewhat playable in pretty much any white deck and it looks pretty powerful we've got toby here we have really solid removal with sheltered by ghosts and trapped in the screen and we have some higher up creatures on the mana curve we'd want to color with a lot of two drops ideally but there's a, two removal spells here which is decent there's one pseudo bomb and a decent amount of creatures at higher mana values. So white looks okay. Oops. I'm trying to look at the blue here. Blue looks awful. Yeah, I mean, these cards really suck that I have set aside here. I mean, Drowner is very good. And Surveyors are quite solid, as is Glimmer Burst. Don't make a sound as... Borderline playable, but this is not a lot of cards here in terms of what is actually decent. Yeah, I think we can mostly just write blue off real quick. Black, we have triple murder, which is pretty wild. And none of the creatures are that bad. I mean, the land cyclers are probably the weakest, but those are still borderline playables. Triple murder is kind of a big deal towards black, just giving us a lot of interaction. Certainly nice. So we got out of red here. Okay, well, red has the highest quantity of cards out of any color we've looked at so far, and the highest quality playables, having two Glassworks and Scorching Dragonfire, so the most removal out of every color, plus the Waltz of Rage if we have high enough power creatures to actually blow up the whole board with this. And even with red as our main color, we have two four power creatures and a five power creature to be able to deal four or five to the board with this. And those are kind of the really pivotal numbers you want. You want those four or five power creatures for a pretty explosive amount of damage. So red looks really, really good here. I mean, I didn't remove like the bad, bad cards like grab the prize and probably cursed recording. I've got one dragon fire and some inside outs I'll play. Trial of Agony, I guess if we end up playing the cursed recording, we can play that alongside it, but really depends on our second color. If our second color is like nothing but good instants and sorceries, we can try out the recording, but the problem is a lot of the, the cards that would usually be taking up instant and sorcery slots in this format are taking up enchantment slots, as you can see by like the double glass works. So instead of having like triple dragon fire and having a bunch of removal that works with the recording, we have one removal spell that works with the recording and then two that don't, which is a little awkward. Um, I don't think any of the creatures are horrible. That is false. Rampaging Soul Rager is horrible. Unless we go blue-red and our blue sucks and has literally zero rooms, so we're not going to go blue-red. So yeah, we'll not play that, but generally speaking, I do think red looks to be our best color so far. Last but hopefully not least, since it's got our Mythic Rare, we'll check out the green. We do have the Overlord of the Haunt Woods. We have the Flesh Burrower, which is the Wombo Combo with Waltz of Rage where we can guarantee that Waltz of Rage is a full-on board wipe because a Death Toucher is dealing damage to every other creature. We also have plenty of other great green cards here. We have Altanac at the very top of the curve. That is an excellent 7-drop, a 9-9 Trample that draws you a card if your opponent ends up killing it. We have some really good Graveyard Recursion, primarily under the skin here being the really, really good one. We pick up whatever we want. But say its name is also good, Pick up any creature or land. Yeah, green looks quite solid here. There are a couple cards I'd really rather not play, so we might be a little light on playables, especially considering we don't have any green, red, gold cards. But I do like our green and our red as some of our best colors here. If we slapped them together, we'd be at 38 cards, and that would be if I did run the Soul Rager about the multi card there were no green red gold cards that's a little rough we had good colorless though right probably not the friendly teddy the ghost vacuum certainly works well here conductive machete is perfectly fine chandelier's fine yeah i think green red looks okay this seal pool really sucks at splashing that's kind of another big bummer that we have going for us we have our one mythic rare and that might be the only piece of mana fixing outside of a couple of random non-basics, and the entire sealed pool, which is wild. Yeah, there's one Overlord of the Haunt Woods, and then I 
I guess, greenhouse, technically. But you really don't want to play a 3-mana card that doesn't affect the board at all and doesn't ramp you. All it does is fix. So you want to get a ton of value off the gazebo for this, and even that 4-mana draw, too. It's kind of a lot. Yeah, our, our mana fixing is abysmal in this sealed pool, but because we could be playing green here, could be playing green-red, we could splash into white easier than any other color because we have a green-white and red-white dual land. So if we play green-red, splash white, that's something. Alternatively, actually... Wait, no, what am I talking about? I don't know why I got excited about Neglected Manor. Yeah, that's not going to be a thing. Splashing into blue would give us the Bookworm and the Growing Dread, which are both really nice cards. I don't feel that our fixing is really here to play just a full-on three-color deck. Is there any reason to splash white? We have a couple enchantments, but not really enough to want to splash a Gremlin Tamer. Or we could just play a Toby at a trapped in the screen, just up our removal count. Also splash in a sheltered by ghosts. This card's kind of still really strong as a late game play. I could see that. We could splash into white a little bit for removal. Maybe a Toby to reach playables here. feel that. I think that's where it's going to be for me. Plenty of reasonable builds here. I do want to take a peek at most color pairs just real quick. Usually I do it off camera, but we're only 12 minutes into the deck build, so I still have a good amount of time here. But just to so show that I did my due diligence, since we have double um, green-blue manifest dread uncommons here, a green-blue manifest dread deck would work really well. But our blue has zero Manifest Dread synergy. It's just so bad here. The only reason to play blue would be for the green-blue uncommon. It's not a single blue card does anything to do with manifesting for our two green-blue uncommons. Yeah, so green-blue manifest isn't a thing. If we go blue-white, we have Gremlin Tamer and Restricted Office. So there's some big reasons to go that direction, potentially. Um, if... The cards are there. So this is 40 cards already. I would be playing Gremlin Tamer and um, Restricted Office and like a couple artifacts, right? Yeah, play the Machete and the Ghost Vacuum. So I could cut four cards out of this deck. Definitely the two Enter the Enigmas. Then I'd also want to cut Unwanted Remake. I'd want to cut Emerge the Cocoon. And that's already four cuts. And from there, we are running some really filler cards like Living Phone, Clammy Prowler, Piranha Fly, Creeping Peeper, Possessed Goat even. Blue White really doesn't look like where it's at. In terms of fixing, if we're not playing green, the only fixing we can rely on is out of our mana base. Which means that if we're blue white and we try to splash to make playables, we can really only splash in a little bit of green. Or tiny bit of black with really bad fixing, just a single duel. So maybe we'd splash in the green-blue uncommons or the black-white rare because it works well with Eerie and we'd be playing blue-white Eerie. Yeah, we'd probably be blue-white with a really bad mana base, some really filler cards, splashing in one victor. Does not feel strong or consistent. And then I want to take a peek at black, because black seemed like maybe the best color to pair with our cursed recording, if we want to try to get that to actually do something. However, I feel like our green is strong enough that uh, green-red in general is just going to be stronger than black-red cursed recording nonsense. So black-red cursed recording cut seven cards at least. And then we could cut more because we'll be playing some artifacts in here. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 creatures. It's a really low creature count. Actually. 
cards in the way we play. One, two, three, four, five, six. Those six cards get cut. I guess this could up the creature count, but it's not very good. We could try to do Cursed Recording with Removal Spell. Nonsense. So we can Cursed Recording with Murders and Dragon Fires. Which is pretty cute. We make it to 7 mana. These are pretty big. But we really need the Sack Fodder to cast these. We don't have any reanimation spells in black to ditch these and then get around the additional casting cost of having to sacrifice something. Yeah, this could be a thing. It does just look a little more awkward and less fleshed out, though, than green does just kind of up front. Yeah, might have been the most reasonable other build we looked at, but I am going to lock in here. So, we can cut at least five cards. We can definitely cut more later. Triple turn inside out can be a bit much. Having one without a creature on board is pretty bad. So, if you have, like, less than 15 creatures, it's certainly awkward to run a ton of copies of these. And even then, running more than, like, two, they can get a little hard. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven creatures. Uh, Twelve, if we manifest with that. Thirteen with under the skin. It's still a bit low. I'm gonna cut, like, two of them immediately, I think. And then I'm going to keep the one in here, and that's going to remind me that I have more if we end up building the deck in a direction where it looks like more are going to be particularly good. So. Is sealed just slow enough for the gazebo? Maybe it is. All right, white is our easiest color to splash. Gives us good removal. Gives us the sheltered. The trapped in the screen. I'll play Toby as well. Just needs a single white. Just throw them in here. Check the colorless. Just ghost vacuum. Definitely playing the machete. Might be so interested in upping my creature count that I end up playing a, like a friendly teddy here or something. I don't think we actually have anything that cares about delirium, weirdly enough. That's the really awkward part about sealed. Is not only is it like really dependent on how good your field pool is, especially with play boosters where you can open like three rares per pack, so you could be like a fifteen rare sealed pool versus a six rare sealed pool. But the synergy that you can really draft and focus around, like, sometimes you just don't open it. Like, green-red as a color pair. It's pretty good at filling its graveyard for Delirium. Like, we've got some artifact creatures, some enchantment creatures, some manifest dread to shove things in the grave. But in the weirdest turn of events in the universe, we don't have a single green or red card in the entire sealed pool that gets any better with delirium which is four more card types in grave so the entire focus of this color pair what they have printed on the draft guide the limited guide of the format you can see it on the premier draft thing that mechanic we have nothing in the whole color pair that does that and that's just sealed for you um yeah, I think this is still just our strongest cards altogether, even if it's not really a synergy deck. To be fair, we don't have much when it comes to synergy. None of our blue synergizes with the green for Manifest Dread. It's also a pretty low enchantment count and bad cards, so it doesn't synergize with the white or black. For eerie stuff, there are literally no blue rooms, so there's completely no synergy for blue-red rooms. A lot of our color pairs are like this. Um, all right. So I'm going to put the Teddy and the Chandelier to the side here. If we really, really need creatures, these are options. But I don't think we need the found footage. 
because we don't care about delirium at all. Another look through everything that I'm not running, just seeing if there's anything tremendously powerful that we're not playing, and it's really just the bookworm. The restricted office and the tamer. I feel like the strongest cards we're not playing. And our blue is just so light, that's what holds us off of tamer and bookworm. Unless we splash those in, and I just don't think they're that good of splashes here. Especially when our fixing in the sealed pool isn't really there either. I mean, we could try like a black-white at the core deck. We would have like no, no creatures in that deck though. Because white had one possessed goat at less than three mana. Black has one fear of lost teeth, one innocuous rat. So we will just get absolutely steamrolled by anybody who opened two drops. Plus then we're playing like double mutilators. We've got a really high curve for a black white deck. And our black white rare isn't even that good. Yeah, you have to get three eerie triggers for it to go crazy. And otherwise it's mainly just surveilling most of the time. And we don't have any cards in the whole sealed pool that trigger Eerie more than once off of their own card. We didn't get any of the common grand entryway that could be like three Eerie triggers off one card. We just have like, I will play one Glimmer token this turn or one enchantment creature. There's also a very low black Eerie count. Yeah, I don't think black white's a thing. All right, but we didn't check it earlier, so taking a quick glance at it there. Seven cards to cut here. And I don't think... I think our creature count is going to be low enough that Norn's just not going to be a good little aggro card. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, with the under the skin. 15 with Machete still. Okay, I have room to drop Norn. I could drop the Teddy as well. The Chandelier. Getting pretty low on creatures, though, so I think I have to cut, like, the combat tricky turn inside out. So just don't love grab the prize. Trials of Agony is pretty bad if you're not very aggressive, and we are making the deck less aggressive here by cutting more creatures. Going a little slower, trying to win off ghost vacuums and just 9-9 nine, nine tramples in the end game. Maybe a one-sided board wipe with Waltz of Rage. Seems fine. One more cut to go. With no other inherent graveyard synergy, I don't mind cutting Say Its Name, as Under the Skin is just like a way better version. Three mana, two, two plus, pick up your best permanent from grave. This is two mana, mill yourself, pick up a creature or a land. The mill yourself, if that gives us no like delirium value or anything, then is really just two mana pick up your best creature so it's a more narrow version of under the skin that also doesn't spit out a 2-2 feels like our weakest non-creature left in the deck at this point do you like the flexibility of break down the door but maybe that would be competing as well with the say its name for the potential cut or just like don't splash the white kind of thing yeah, I'm going to drop the Say Its Name here. I think this is probably the build we go for. We're going green-red in the sealed pool, but looking at this and looking at the dual lands, I did see one potential other path to take one peek at before we lock in. But I'm going to go ahead and save this deck. So if we decide this one's better, I don't have to rebuild it. And then one last thing. These dual lands will work either direction. Whether we splash the white or potentially if we splash the red and the reason that i was thinking that might be a thing is that our biggest issue with our white like white was very good with really good removal and a great rare our biggest issue with our white was the lack of early creatures and our green's got three two drops at the very least so it's got something covering that flaw a little bit 
Now, I do think the green-red deck is still maybe a little bit more consistent, but this deck would more consistently play slightly more powerful cards, because I think Toby and Sheltered by Ghosts are some of the strongest cards in our sealed pool. Um, like, stronger than anything we have in red. But, I don't know. Red would uh, would certainly be curving out a little more consistently. It also has a little more removal. So it's just a more consistent deck in general. This deck has a higher ceiling. When it draws its good hands, it's going to be stronger, but it will draw the good hands less often. And again, with our dual lands, we could splash towards the red, maybe. I guess I would have to play like a mountain or two. Yeah, I guess they work a little less well splashing red than they would splashing white. Um, we could still get some of that red removal into this deck. So we can get the dragon fire in here. At least, maybe not the glass works. Yeah, I guess splashing into red, though, is a little awkward, because the one thing we splash in is probably just Dragonfire. If that, we just put Dragonfire in, maybe the glass works, but we can't really splash in the Walt. Yeah, this did and out a little, a little less well than I hoped it would. I do think these four are probably the cuts. This deck's got a good curve. It's got the Great Rare. It's only got two removal spells. Sheltered by Ghosts and Trapped in the screen, and that could definitely be an issue. But the mana base is more consistent if we go for just a two-color deck. I guess the curve is a tiny bit worse. Got less at two mana. Yeah, I think these are the best decks. Living Foam, generally not very good, but when it's Death Trigger, can potentially find a Toby-level bomb. It's a fine inclusion. Emerge looks kind of whack in here, though. I think I am just really finding myself needing lots of interaction in this format, so I'm going to go for the green-red splash the white, other than this way around. Go for a little bit of a less consistent deck or uh, more interaction here. Less consistent mana base, I should say, for more interaction. Yeah, this still looks fine. I mean, we probably want to throw planes in here, though. I could see a little argument for cutting Toby because removal spells are still great. If we top deck them, or if we don't find the white source till really late in the game, removal's still going to be super relevant. Maybe Toby's less so. But I mean, even really late in the game, this is 5-5 five, five worth of stats. I think I'm keeping Toby in. And the only fixing we have is Overlord. So, actually cut a red source so it's more likely to find double green to play this turn 3. If we need to, I'm pending this just to fix our mana. Which is going to be a thing sometimes. Dropping that turn three to get the white mana going. So yeah, put a planes in here. Call it a deck. This was a little bit of a rough build here. It's a little bit of a rough sealed pool. Don't feel tremendously confident with the deck, but I do feel that this is somewhere in the range of the best decks that this sealed pool can build. It's somewhere playing in this Naya space, I feel. Yeah, a lot of awkward synergies missed here with our two-color pairs, stuff like that, but here we have a ton of interaction. We have some bomb power with, like, Waltz of Rage and an Overlord, maybe a splashed in Toby if we have perfect man in the opener, and, of course, the Ghost Vacuum. So it's got some good things going for it that could steal some games, and fingers crossed it steals some games for us, because it would be nice to day two on the first try not have to just spew gems and gold, but we'll see how it wraps up. We'll see how it ends up for us as we head into the gameplay and see how this deck does. 
All right, we'll keep this opener. It's definitely uh, got some risk here. But we've got the Ghost Vacuum to get started to shut off any of our opponent's graveyard synergies. And we have the Under the Skin, so we at least have a 3-drop creature. And of course, we can play around this to where we're going to make sure to manifest the permanence into the grave and then pick that up. So there's 3 mana, 2-2 two, two draw card is super fine. Mono green from our opponent so far, but they have the Spine Seeker Centipede. That would have been very nice in our sealed pool. Sadly, we didn't get any of the green fixing commons. The Spine Seeker Centipede or the Moldering Gem would have helped us a lot, making this white splash more consistent. So they're on green black here. Well, this is awkward. I certainly don't really want to Glassworks a 2-1. That already got a good ETB, but I also don't want to really under the skin without huge value. I don't think I have too much of another choice here. We kind of need to play to the board, make sure we're not falling behind, taking a bunch of extra damage. Well, that's rough. I suppose Toby goes to hand because Overlord is the much better card to flip up. Yeah, that's how we don't miss Toby's cast trigger. Okay, that's not rough at all. I lied. If that were a manifest on any other card, that would be sad. But because it's on Under the Skin, we actually get to put Toby to the hand and guarantee we get the 4-4 four, four and just go crazy. Kona, I see. That is sketchy enough to just Glassworks that, I think. I could kill it with Scorching Dragonfire, that's more mana efficient, but also I'm not doing anything with my other mana anyway, so it's actually better to play the more expensive card and get it out of the way. Unless they play specifically like a good 4 toughness card, but this way I also get to put that under the Ghost Vacuum. So there's an upside to that as well. But this is the kind of card, like with a good survival ability like this, I just want to stop it before... It does anything. You never know what's going to happen. They could have a Valgavoth in their hand. If it didn't have any kind of trigger like that, we could just wait and try to set up a good Waltz of Rage, probably with the 4-4 dealing 4 to everybody or something like that. Alright, Scorching Dragonfire still has an excellent target if we don't Waltz in time to stop the Brood Spinner. Although with Ghost Vacuum, Brood Spinner is also considerably weaker. we can keep exiling their graveyard to stop their delirium. Okay. Alright, well, since I didn't draw another green source, I don't have to choose if it's better to flip this up or to play a Toby, because I can't flip this up without double green. So we can just play a Toby and hold up a Scorching Dragonfire, and that is an excellent turn. If I did hit the green source, I would have to think quite a bit on that one. Because this is a lot of stats on the board, so I would probably go with the Toby. But the earlier you start making extra lands, the more impactful those extra lands are going to be. Okay, could Scorch here in the end step. Could also Ghost Vacuum my own card. I don't think that's worth it. I've got a Waltz coming up. It's on an Overlord. Hello, Sheltered by Ghosts. Ooh. 5-4 lifelinking token. Oh my god, and then if they don't kill it... If they don't kill this... Then I can Waltz of Rage with a lifelink? That's too funny to me. Oh, I do have to attack with two creatures. I gotta... Goodbye, Toby. You will not die in vain if they choose not to double block. Ooh. Aw. To block Toby with Centipede, that's actually pretty sweet. Okay, this is fine. Sorry, Toby. I didn't want to lose the Overlord. 
But I did want to declare that attack to threaten the whole... Um, Scorching Dragonfire blow up their double block thing. Alright, hopefully their removal is too expensive to pay the ward on this thing. But Toby's also just a really good card to have in our grave for Ghost Vacuum. Get a bunch of 1-1 flyers and a 4-4 on the ground. Oof. Alright, well, goodbye, beast. Sad day. I need the green mana before I get to board wipe here. Twenty-one life. Imagine we just take this. Try to save Dragonfire for post board wipe. Because they're gonna manifest a bunch of times. Where to green, though? Um, machete holding up dragon fire. Looks like the best line. No! No! I might have to discard an Altenac to get a green source onto the board. Picks up any land, right? Yeah, so the dual land is better, technically, to have engraved. I, mean, I guess I can Waltz of Rage on this 4-3 phase down without a green source. Never mind. If I can pop the Beastie pre-Waltz, that's pretty good value. Because Waltz doesn't exile. So this way, if they cast their other Beastie, they're only going to be left with the 1-2-2 two, two post board wipe. They pop the insects, it's also pretty fine for us, popping those pre-board wipe. Alright, I think we need to lock in the board wipe here. This is too much happening. They are going to be left with a 2-2, but we're going to be left with an overlord. Am I going to have the mana for this? 5 to flip this up and 5 to board wipe? Shoot, I'm not going to have the mana. Oh no. Equip for four and then waltz for five. I need nine mana. I'm gonna have seven. Oh shoot. Yeah, even if I flip it up, I don't quite have the mana, do I? I guess it might be just time for a ghost vacuum then. Still at 17 life, so I just if I just slow down the game with a ghost vacuum, that would also be probably fine. Yeah, I mean, that really clutters up the board with a lot of blockers. I guess I can hold ult and act then. Scorch here. I think I scorch here. Like, if I'm not going to kill the Brood Spinner and I'm going to lose the Ghost Vacuum, that, I, that is a genuine threat. There's the green source. Well, I feel decent for not discarding Altenac, but do I play it instead of activating Ghost Vacuum? I think I shall. Although there are no more creatures in Grave for Ghost Vacuum, since it was exile removal used on the spider. Maybe they'll murder Altenac and we'll get him in the vacuum too. They still have so many cards to play around with here. Okay. That's pretty decent for us. Just extending more into the board wipe.
five to turn this up. Two, three, four. I'll have three mana up outside of that. It means I can't do anything but turn that up that turn. Okay. I'm going to just turn that up then. Because that's going to allow me to wipe the board and still have my entire board left. The Ultanek and the 6-5. They'll have a manifested card, but... You get the gist. Ghost Vacuum is, unfortunately, a sorcery speed ability to make the ghosts, so if they ever draw removal for it, they can pop it. I am going to assume and pray that if they had instant speed removal to kill Altanak they would have killed it and attacked with everybody, because I had a 2-2 blocker if this left the board. So if they have something that can blow up the Overlord, they shut off the Waltz, and we are entirely on the Ghost Vacuum win con now. Unless it's the 6 damage removal spell specifically. I guess they are mostly green-red. I just, I see that swamp. All right. We are golden. Now there's so much more fuel for the vacuum, too. This thing would have to be four power to kill Altanak. I mean, they get trampled over for so much anyway, it's worth the swing, even if Altanak dies. All right, there's the concession from our opponent. Really lucky they didn't have interaction there. Come to think of it, it may have been safer to just use it on Altanak, because like we knew if they had a removal that could kill a 9-9, they would have done it so they could have attacked in with the whole board, because then I had a single 2-2 up. But it's entirely possible. I don't know if I would say likely, since they didn't end up having it, but, you know, it's a perfectly reasonable chance that they could have had a removal spell like the red and four instant that deals six to target creature and that's just sitting in their hand because it's not going to kill an ultanac but it would absolutely kill the overlord and then if they killed the overlord in response to the waltz we would just be really sad there but again we would still be in the game because ghost vacuum they still weren't killing that thing but it would have been a way more difficult fight so that might have been actually a little risky it might have been worth just yeah, whatever, give up on the Overlord. Just pop it on the Altanac. But it worked out great for us, so I'll take it. Start things off 1-0, heading into game two. Alright, game two. No white source for trapped in the screen, but we can just glassworks all the early plays. And then play a 7-6. That's the plan for now. Terramorphic. Aw, oh, stick fixing. Two opponents, two players I'm jealous of in a row. Last opponent had the Centipede, that would be awesome in this deck, and this opponent has the Terramorphic Expanse, that's also excellent fixing. Black-white from our opponent, there's a Fear of Lost Teeth to get things rolling. There's an Altanac, okay, well now we're just gonna cycle the Branch Snapper, help us make sure we get to seven mana by the end game, and have that massive finisher. I also need double green for that, as well as some other spells in the deck, and I'm not doing anything else with my mana. Hello, Watchdog. Watchdog, you're actually miserable against Fear of Lost Teeth. That's unfortunate. Imagine I just have to play you in one for one trade into that versus one for one trading the Glassworks into it. Neither of these trades are profitable for me, but with the Watchdog, at least I surveil two. At least I surveil one.
All right. Amalgam's a much better trade. They offer that. Okay. Got a 3-2 to block the Amalgam. Or sorry, a 2-2 two -two to block the 3-2 Amalgam here. Got the Branch Snapper if I top deck a land. This feels reasonable. I guess I could flip it up as a Death Toucher in case they trick me. Hmm. I could pick up both of these, that'd be awesome. I guess Branch Snapper is sort of like both, because if I miss the land drop, then I cycle the Branch Snapper next turn, and if I don't miss, then I just cast it. You. That's pretty great here. Probably just get the mana out of the way, because I'm not doing anything else with it right now. If I don't top deck the land, we blow up Fear of Immobility and cycle Branch Snapper. Honestly, that might just be the better play at this point. I could cycle the Alta deck to guarantee I'm playing Branch Snapper, but then if they just play another Fear of Immobility, we're in such a bad spot. I mean, 14 life, I play a Branch Snapper, they Fear of Immobility tap this one, or they just kill this one with removal. This gets through, but Watchdog blocks there. I take 5, go to 9. That's still livable. And that's like the worst case scenario. Looks like it's happening though. Oh, Jesus Christ. No, worst case scenario is that their sealed pool is infinitely more synergistic than ours. And they have the sack removal spell to kill our 3-1 and our branch snapper. Gross. I think I actually keep this. Because even if I hit land 7, I can't just slam down a 9-9 next turn or I'm so likely to die. At this point, I have to start casting removal. Five toughness, you say. Well, at least they have to kill my... Um, my Death Toucher to get that through. But five is the magic number. Wow. Yeah, I mean, they just opened a draft deck in a sealed event. That's filthy. They got us. I don't think there's much we could have done here. If I knew exactly what was in their hand, I guess we could have exiled Fear of Mobility so they couldn't reanimate it. I mean, they are black-whites. So that'd be a reasonable assumption. But I wanted to save the instant speed removal to play during their turn in response to nonsense. And I think that's also reasonable to do. Well. I guess that just gave me the tiniest chance ever. And they just ride the moth again and then I kill that and then maybe an alternac goes the distance. They flood from here. We have action. Well, with these two, we have action. And technically, I have the one for one trade for whatever they reanimate. I've got the Death Toucher. I no longer have the Death Toucher. There's a Scavenger now. Wow. Alright. That's a really strong deck. That was unwinnable. Game 3 it is. Oh boy. 
Yeah, no, I think we actually drew pretty well. Had a pretty strong hand there with the well-timed Waltz of Rage, but that was insane from our opponent. That was just excellent stuff. All right. Here we are on the play for game three, rolling out with the Watchdog. Easy mill on the mountain, looking for planes. Dragonfire Watchdog is not bad at all. Get a pretty solid removal spell just spent on a two drop here. These draws are pretty bad, exclusively mountains so far. Off the top. Wow, all right. Again, we're pretty fine seeing this because we are certainly not an aggro deck here. So if they want to blow a bunch of removal on our early threats, that's fine. They won't have the removal ready later. Right, Razorkin for Razorkin seems fair. And we've got four white sources in the deck. We have three white lands and a... Um, an overlord that spits out a, a land of every color. This is a problem. Until we find a white source. Could two for myself to kill it if I attack into it. Um, or if I tried to attack into it, potentially. Alright, that's just GG, period. That mythic rare is stronger than everything in our sealed pool. There goes the white source, too. Bummer. Yeah. Not all overlords are built equally. Mine maybe fixes us a little bit. Theirs kills our best creature every time it attacks or enters. Now we just go to one, because the overlord just kills our, our blocker anyway. Oh, or they just have the combat trick in hand to kill us, I guess. If they don't have the combat trick in hand, that was a very bold play. So if I can blow that up in the Shattered Yard, then I have a shot now that I didn't otherwise. Alright, well, I guess I have no shot. Play one creature, die to Menace, not even to mention Shattered Yard, yep. Alright. That's how the cookie crumbles for us. It's one and two, and I think the only thing we really could have done on that one was I could have mulliganed the opener for having two white cards in it. But even like a strong six card hand from our deck is not going to compete with an overlord particularly well. It is a brutal card. We are one and two heading to game four. I have more white sources in the deck than white cards, but I've drawn the white cards more often than the white sources, and that's just magic, baby. FOMO It's an excellent card. Two mana, two, three with a bunch of bonus text. Absolute classic. Draw the second white card in a row. Hmm. And this is strong enough when it gets delirium to just pop it here. Sure, cycle a megalodon. Hello, Ghost Vacuum. We get to go back to something like Game 1, where we get to play our own rares here.
pretty unlikely to flip either of these up particularly profitably. Uh-oh. Well, they're definitely going to kill this then. If they're playing Enduring Curiosity, it draws them like infinite cards. It draws them a card for every creature they control that damages us. Happy to have Exile removal for that. Alright, well they draw a card either way, so I'm going to block this one, because if I block this, it's going to come back as the enchantment, and I'm still going to have to get rid of it. So if I exile it instead, then I'm just spending one card on it. Now this white splash has gone really, really badly. Maybe just running green red up front with more mediocre filler would have played better. But again, looking at our two losses, those decks were phenomenal. Don't think a couple random filler cards being in our hand instead of these would have helped us. But this game looks close enough so far. Maybe it would matter. Alright, solid combo there. Free of isolation, get another 1-1 one, one out of the Glimmer Light. I might just die since we don't have a creature to waltz with. Can't just ghost vacuum a single 1-1, one, one, can I? No. Suppose, if we go back to the drawing board here, if we do end up losing this game, and we just won three here, I think the best way that our sealed pool could have just been a two-color deck with no splashing would have been to just go for that green-white deck. But that deck has less interaction, so it gets overwhelmed by great cards a little more often, and that's how we've lost all of our games, just getting absolutely overrun. By some great cards. Well, no, our first loss was just like great synergy in general. Alright, I mean, we're so dead. At least I can dig for the white here. Off the FOMO and not find it. Technically, only really, really need one removal spell. Just need the white source. I don't need to waltz here. I have an overlord myself, but I feel constantly outclassed. Well, now I need double removal. And that is no removal. Move Glimmerlight to the other flyer, chump die. Machete costs four to equip, so I don't have the mana to put Machete here and then waltz. Can't beastie and waltz. I'm dead. One in three it is. Brutal run. I don't want to say that there was nothing we could do. Because that's not true. In Sealed, things are always nebulous. It's really difficult to find the exact best build of the deck. And there's technically always a different version you could run. So, 
I don't think we built a super incorrect deck or anything, but we certainly could have played something else here, and maybe the other deck would have played better. Um, certainly with us just never finding the white mana, uh, just pure green-white would have been the best deck we looked at in terms of how it played out, but again, those were just some rough, rough matchups. It felt like we were outclassed every time by just more synergistic cards, more fixing when our opponents were doing splashy things, and stronger bombs at the top end just felt like better sealed pools and not a ton we could do. Gameplay-wise, yeah, again, maybe we're supposed to just go when we have a weaker sealed pool like this and we just have a real lack of fixing, we're supposed to just go for whatever two-color pair has the most consistent curve, that way we don't have any dead cards in hand, even if they are pretty filler, at least we get to cast every card in our hand every game and try our hardest in those fights. But I just don't know how far that even would have taken us, losing the last two games to the red Overlord Mythic and the blue Overlord Mythic. Those still would have been games where we just would have had to have drawn the one of the three ways in our entire deck to actually kill them. Sheltered by ghosts, trapped in the screen, or break down the door being our only answers to those. And actually, come to think of it, that final matchup, this deck technically has a much better matchup there, because their strongest card is that 5-3 Overlord, and we actually have three extra removal spells that can kill that thing by being in green-red than we would have if we weren't playing the red here, if we were just green-white at the core. So technically, our final matchup, we had the best deck we could have against that deck specifically, we just did not draw... Did not draw quite well enough with some mana issues again. I mean, maybe... No, because if we cut the white, then we have just as much removal as if we played green-white against it. Yeah. Awkward stuff. Bit of an awkward sealed pool. We went for some awkward splashes, and it really didn't pan out for us. Got stuck off of that color a few times and ran up against some pretty strong decks, and that is magic. That'll happen. One and three it is. We have lost the sealed lottery this time around. But that's why they call it the sealed lottery. You can always buy another ticket. But that is going to end today's video. And as always, I'd like to thank my patrons and YouTube members for their support, as well as you for watching the video. If you enjoyed it and you're interested in seeing some more, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to fill the YouTube algorithm to send you some more in your recommended feed. If you'd like to catch me live, you can check out the Twitch channel in the link in the description below. If you'd like to support the channel directly, you can check out the Patreon link in the description below. But other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.